Okay, I'm sorry uh, this recording is a little bit late. For most of you, it probably didn't really have an impact, but uh, you know, I try really hard to respect your time and your schedules, so I feel really bad that this is coming to you a day late. Today, before we, we've, over the past few weeks, we've looked at steel in axial uh, loading and bending, and we've looked at wood in axial loading and bending, so beams and columns. Concrete, before we can jump into our next material, we need to understand what's happening. Steel was pretty easy. It was isotropic, meaning it behaved the same in all directions. Wood got a little bit harder because it was organic and it was not isotropic, meaning it didn't behave the same in all the directions. Concrete is even more unique. Concrete we're not talking about just concrete. What we're talking about in design is reinforced concrete. So we may colloquially say concrete, but we're talking about reinforced concrete. And what makes reinforced concrete intriguing is that it's composite. We have concrete and steel working together to do the job. And so if we're going to design things to see if they're strong enough to withstand the load, we have to understand how those two materials work together. What's really interesting is that um, we have two ways we can make materials behave together. We can have them share loads or we can make them composite. Concrete, we often make them composite so that they behave in a very particular way. So what we're gonna talk about this week is load sharing, then we're gonna talk about composite action, and then we're gonna look at some calculation examples about why would we bother to make things composite. And then next, and then we'll also look at a few other materials that are composite action. And then next week we'll jump into concrete beams and columns. And because we've kind of gone through the process, the beams and columns for concrete can be a shorter, uh, the, the beams and columns can be compressed into one lecture. After that, we'll only have two more classes. One I believe is a, like a review and problems uh, that I'll work through some problems if I remember what I put on the syllabus correctly. Uh, but the last lecture, the last lecture is the really fun one. That's the beam testing lecture. Um, so Dave and I, Dave and I will create a bunch of beams. Um, and if this was the if this was normal times, I'd come in and we'd test them in front of you guys. And it's kind of a fun, a fun real live demonstration. Instead, we're going to have to record it. <clears throat> um, but, but that's okay. We'll try to do what we can to make it interesting for you guys. Um, and hopefully the trains aren't too loud because that was the big problem last year. I was trying to record that in the backyard where I'm like 200 meters from the train tracks, three, three train tracks. Okay, load sharing, transform sections, which don't worry about that. I'll talk about what that is. Composite action, so load sharing and composite action calculation examples, and then some composite structural construction images. So load sharing. Load sharing is when two elements or materials are arranged so that they mutually support the load they are said to, if they are doing that, they are said to be sharing the load. The proportion of load that each resists is proportional to the stiffness of the element or material load will follow the greatest resistance or the stiffest element. So all of that, you know, nonsense of follow the path of least resistance, in loads, load goes to the stiffest element. It doesn't go to the least uh, stiff element, it goes to the stiffest element. It will try to carry the most load. So what does that mean? Let's think about what that means. Okay. Multiple elements supporting the same load share it based on stiffness. But what makes up stiffness? What do we think of? We know that E is something for us there because remember that was that modulus of elasticity and we often talked about it being um, the stiffness. But we also know that area can impact um, how stiff something is. So if we had um, if we had uh, a beam and it was in bending and we wanted to make it stiffer, we could make it deeper. 
we've added material to it. So it looks like there's some weird combination there. The load likes the path with most resistance. Okay, let's do a thought exercise. If you have a steel rod wrapped in Play-Doh, you put a book on top and then you stand on that book. What is going to take the load? What is going to take the most load? Hold on just a second. Okay, so if you have a steel rod wrapped in Play-Doh and you put a book on top and you stand on that, what part of that do you think is gonna take most of your load? Well, you know that the steel rod is going to be the thing that takes the majority of your load because you intuitively understand that the steel rod is way stiffer, even though it has way less area. Now let's think about that exact same situation, but instead of Play-Doh, let's make it wood around the steel rod. In this situation, if we put the book on top of that and stand on it, it's not obvious to us which one is going to take more of the load. So it's not obvious. We know that the steel is way stiffer, but the area of the wood is larger and the wood is not so much less stiff than the steel that it does nothing at all. One thing that we do know is if we were to squash that steel rod, the wood would be moving with it. And in the Play-Doh, we know that the Play-Doh would move with it as well. You could even try this by taking like um, an eraser and putting like um, a pasta noodle through, like a piece of spaghetti through it. As you squash it, they would have to be moving together. One might be going along for the ride, um, or it's taking such a small amount of load that it's deforming. Remember that strain equation that we talked about? So <clears throat> how would they share this load? So remember, if they're sharing load at all, they need to be squashing together, or they need to have the same amount of change in length. So they're both moving the same amount um, and they both had the same original length. So if they're moving together, they're gonna have the same strain. So remember, stress equals force divided by area, or we can rearrange that and force equals stress times area. We remember that strain equals delta L divided by L and that E equals stress divided by strain. Again, we can rearrange that. So stress is E times uh, strain. So modulus, modulus of elasticity times strain. So this is just our three equations that we've been working with since the second week of the term. What if we start substituting things into each other? <clears throat> okay, so we had stress right here and stress is E times strain. So let's take this and plop it in for stress. So force equals E A times strain. So the modulus of elasticity, the area, and the strain. So E and A are, can be for each material because the strain has to be the same because they're moving together. So the strain is going to be the same for each thing. These both have the same strain. And so the force that the steel is taking is going to be the equivalent of EA of the steel times the strain. And FC, or the force in the concrete, is going to be EA of the concrete times the strain. And the strain is the same for both of these. They're moving together. Okay. But we want to talk about this as the total load. So the total load is all the force. We don't know what that particular force is. We know that some of it is going to the steel and some of it is going to the concrete. Well, the force in the steel was the EA of the steel times the strain plus the EA of the concrete times the strain. Well, the strain is common to both of these. If you guys remember messing around with equations, we can take that strain and bring it outside of that equation. So we have EA of the steel plus EA of the concrete. Well, that's just the sum of all the EAs. If we added a third material, we could toss that in there too. So the total force is the strain, which is the same for all the materials across the board, 
times the sum of all the EAs or all the combined stiffnesses. So some portion, so this load sharing is dependent on the overall stiffness and the overall stiffness is made up of a combination of the modulus of elasticity and the area. So the sum of EA is the axial stiffness of the combined total system. We can uh, rearrange this equation and we can get that strain equals the total force divided by the sum of the EAs. Well, let's plug that back into our uh, force for the steel and the force for the concrete. So if we plug this back in for the strain, and remember the strain is the same for both things. So the total force divided by the sum of all of the stiffnesses, which is EA. So this is the total of the system here. Um, so we can plug that back in to this equation. That means the force in the steel is the total force times the ratio of the stiffness of the steel divided by the stiffness of the system. So this is just a ratio. This is saying how stiff the steel is compared to the total system. And that tells us how much of that force goes to the steel. This is the total force times the ratio of stiffness of the concrete of the overall system. So all, both of these added up would equal the total force. I know that was a lot of information. I find that the best way to do this one is with an example. So we can plug the strain for the total force divided by the sum of the EA back into the following. Essentially, we are saying that the force in the steel is the total force times the EA of the steel divided by the sum of all the EAs and the force in the concrete equals the total force times the force, the stiffness of the concrete divided by the total stiffness of the system. All right. We have a steel HSS 152 by 152 by 9.5 column filled with concrete. What load in kilonewtons does the steel carry and what load does the concrete carry if the E or the modulus of elasticity of the concrete is 30,000 MPa? Take a guess which will carry more load, the steel or the concrete. So this is where I always like you to take a second and guess intuitively what you think is gonna happen. So I'm looking at this, hmm, there's a lot more area of the concrete. I don't know how much more, but I don't know, more than double, I would say, or about double. And then the stiffness of steel is 200, or the modulus of elasticity of steel is 200,000. And the modulus of elasticity of concrete is 30,000. Mm. I am going to guess that it's going to be somewhere around 50 50. Uh, I, I think maybe more might go to the steel, but I'm not quite sure. So, but around 50 50. It's not like 90% of the, the, I think, I, it's not like I think 90% of the load is going to go to the steel or the concrete. It looks somewhere close to 50-50 plus minus, you know, a bunch because I'm eyeballing this. Okay, so let's go through this calculation. Okay. Bring this up here. All right. Nice to have my worked out solution right here so I don't screw up while I'm talking to you guys. All right, so we have this. Lovely HSS, which we know all kinds of things about because we can look them up in the steel properties. So we have access to all kinds of information about this in the steel properties. And then it is filled with concrete. All right, we can look up the area of the steel. It's 500 
5,210 millimeters squared. I looked this up in the table for steel properties. Now, in your assignment, you have a problem similar to this where you have to look up the steel area. In the past two years or three years, they've issued a new steel book. Usually the steel properties of the members don't change unless there was a typo. And it seems like someone found a typo. The, 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 um, the, uh, the pages that I've given you guys for the steel properties were printed off like six years ago. The latest steel code, which is rather than go look up the tables I had given you, I just looked it up directly in my steel book. And at some point in there, they changed the area slightly, um, meaning all of the work I had done was based on what was in my steel book. Can you pass me my steel book there, Dave? Sure can. So I had looked it up in this book. Um, so because all of my math matched that, um, and it, there was like a real point to what I had done. I've given you guys the steel area in the question in your assignment where I actually show you the update for that W150 by 37 that's published in this now. And it's only a small change, but because it's um, a sequential question, it has a really big impact on what the answers are. So please use the one that's directly in the assignment. Okay. We know that knowing E and A of the steel and concrete is going to be really important. What is the E of steel? That's right, it's 200,000 MPA. Okay, let's calculate E, A of steel. Because we know that knowing that combined stiffness is kind of handy. So we've got 5,210 times 200,000. We've got 5,210 times 200,000. We've got 1.04 times 10 to the 9. And this was uh, millimeters squared, and this was newtons per millimeter squared, meaning this is in newtons. Okay, let's figure out, sorry, the area of our concrete. Okay, it depends what mood I'm in, but this is a big enough chunk of area for the steel that I'm going to remove it from the total area to figure out the area of our concrete. If we're talking about rebar in a math problem, we tend not to bother removing the area of the steel from the concrete area. It is so nominal compared to the area of the concrete that we just don't bother. That said, in the assignment, I very explicitly tell you what to do. So make sure you pay attention to that. So the area of the concrete is 152 minus 9.5 times 2 times 152 minus 9.5 times 2. So where did that come from? That was 152. And that was 152. And that was 9.5. Now, we could have calculated 152 by 152 and minus the 5,210. That's a totally acceptable way, way to do it as well. You will get slightly different numbers as your answer, which is why I'm telling you to pay attention to how I ask for it in the question. So, 152 minus 9.5 times 2. We get... 17,689 millimeters squared. Let's see what it would have been had I done 152 by 152 minus 5,210. It would have been pretty darn close to that. So you can see that in the final calculations for trying to figure something out, 
they would be very they would be almost the same answer like plus minus a small amount of percentage why do i get so caught up on you doing it a particular way because quercus is our overlord right now and trying to do math it can't look at it and see that you did it right, but just used a slightly different process. So we have to be consistent so that Quercus can mark it easily. I don't just do it to be mean, I promise. And the E of the concrete they gave us in the question was 30,000 MPa. Concrete um, modulus of elasticity is dependent on the mix of the concrete. So it's not always obvious to us what that is going to be um, until uh, we either tell them what it has to be um, or they tell us what it came out as. All right, so the EA of the concrete is going to be 17,689 times 30,000. All right, 17,689 times 30,000. We get 0 0.531 times 10 to the 9 newtons. Okay, I just want to stop and have you think about this here. If this total stiffness of the system is a combination of the modulus elasticity and the amount of area that we have, and this is that combination for steel, and that is this combination for concrete. Now, which one do you think is going to take more of the load? Well, we know that the stiffer it is, and this is defining its stiffness, the stiffer it is, the more load it takes. It now looks to me that, yeah, it's pretty obvious that the steel is gonna take more load than the concrete. Maybe twice as much load as the concrete, or around twice as much which if 100% is the whole, that looks like maybe two thirds of the overall load would go to the steel and a third of the overall load would go to the concrete. So I'm starting to be able to infer a lot as we go through this. What is the sum of the overall stiffness? Well, it's the, sorry, the EA of the steel plus the EA of the concrete or 1.04 times 10 to the 9 plus 0 0.531 times 10 to the 9. 1.04 plus 0 0.531, 1.571 times 10 to the 9 newtons. Well, now we can figure out F for the steel. So remember, it was the total force times the EA of the steel divided by the sum of the EAs. Or force, we don't know what the force is. They didn't give it to us. The total force times the EA of the steel, which is 1.04 times 10 to the 9, divided by the sum of all of the EAs, which is 1.571 times 10 to the 9, the force in the steel, 1.04 divided by 1.571, is 0.662F, or 66% of the force goes to the steel. Now, if there's only two materials, if 66% goes to the steel, you know that there's only 33% left to go to the concrete. But let's check it out here. The total force times the EA of the concrete divided by the sum of the EAs, or the force times 0 0.531 times 10 to the 9, divided by 1.571 times 10 to the 9, 531 divided by 1.571, we get 0.338F. So close to 34% of the load goes to the concrete. What this means is that if we need to be able to determine if the steel is strong enough 
or if the concrete is strong enough, now all of a sudden both of these need to work. The steel needs to be able to carry this amount of load and the concrete needs to be able to carry this amount of load. Because the load will be distributed according to this, we now need to be able to check that the reduced capacity of the steel is greater than the factored load on the steel. And we need to make sure that the reduced capacity of the concrete is greater than the factored load on the concrete. So to know that, we need to know how much of the total load is going to each part of that element. Okay. So here's that worked out. All right, what's a transformed section? We can think of one of the elements in terms of the other, or we pretend it's the other one. If we have figured out what the EAs of the material is, we could easily pretend that they both have, if they both, if we know the total EA of each material, we could then say, all right, well, what if we pretended one of those materials Ha or both of those materials have the same E, for example, what area would then make up that material? So if we have the strain equals the force divided by the sum of the total EAs, for any object of any material or combo of materials, will act the same as long as the sum of the EAs is the same. So we want that total to be the same. So this EA, this total 1.57 times 10 to the 9 MPA, it could be either of the following. It could be E of 1.571 times 10 to the 9 MPA and one millimeter squared of area. We don't know. Once we have this total, how it's broken up is irrelevant. In fact, how we broke up um, the EA of the concrete or the EA of the steel so before, we had EA of concrete and EA of steel. Well then, one, once we know what the total is, we can ascribe the same E or the same area to both of those materials and figure out what makes the whole. Again, I know this is a weird thing to be saying, and I'll show you why it's helpful. So you need to know it exists. You're gonna have to do the math, but don't worry about it. This isn't like, um, this isn't the most important calculation you're ever gonna do, but it is a nice little calculation to have one question on the exam of it. Uh, so the transformed area equals N times AS. So the transformed area is N divided by AS, or the ratio of their modulus of elasticities. So we want to know, for example, if that wasn't steel and concrete, what would it have been to have the equivalent stiffness if it was all concrete? So we already know a chunk of it was concrete, but what if we wanted to pretend the amount that was steel around it was also concrete? How big would that concrete need to be for that system to have the same total stiffness as this system? And so what we're gonna do is figure out the ratio of their modulus of elasticity so we can figure out what that area of steel would need to turn into to make it concrete. All right, so transform the steel into concrete from the previous example. So we still have all of that same information that we had. Let's make this bigger. All right, so. We already have our EA of our steel, our A of steel, our E of steel, our EA of steel, our area of concrete, our E of concrete, and our EA of concrete, and we have our total EA. Well, we want to know what the transformed area is. So AT is going to be ES divided by EC times the area of the steel. So we want to transform the area of the steel into concrete. And we're doing that by saying, okay, we're pretending we have a material that's much less stiff, therefore we need a greater area. 
If this needs to be the same total stiffness, and we're now pretending the steel is a material that's less stiff, we must need more area. So the E of the steel was 200,000 MPa divided by our 30,000 MPa times our area of steel, which was 5,210. 5, so the transformed area of the steel into concrete is 200,000 divided by 30,000 times our 5,210. Or 34,733 millimeters squared. Well, that makes sense. If the, uh, the steel needed to take two thirds of the load and the concrete took one third, and we're now pretending that the steel is also concrete, it makes sense that to take two thirds of the load, it would need to be two thirds of the area. So the steel was twice as stiff as the concrete, and if they're both the same material, then it needs to have about twice the area. And that looks to be about right. If that was the area of the concrete, our new transformed steel into concrete needs to be, out, be about uh, 34,733 millimeters squared. So that means our area total, which is our transformed area plus our area of the concrete, is 33,743, plus our 17,633, or total area, 34, 7, 33, 7, 7, 6, 8, 9, of 5,000, or 52,422 millimeters squared. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Essentially, what we've done is figured out, so this amount of concrete that was originally concrete has stayed the same. We've turned this steel into concrete. So this was a stiffer material that had less area. How much area would it need to be if it was the same stiffness? Remember, this system has the same overall combined stiffness as this system. I'm acknowledging we're forgetting about buckling. So we're totally ignoring buckling. Don't worry about buckling with this. We're just looking at the material stiffness. So the material and area combined. So just about squashing. So you guys don't know why the heck we'd bother with this. But we're going to see next week, it ends up being very handy when we talk about bending. So we've talked about it in a load sharing application here, but you're going to see that it can really start to help us out. Okay. Uh, oh, I do a column example now. Look at me. So I won't lift this up to me. Um... Okay, so uh, we have a 250 by 350 concrete column that has an E of uh, 25,000 MPa with eight 20 M bars. Here we have the area of what those bars are. We're going to talk next week about reinforcing and concrete, but for this example, I just wanted to give you a quick look at it. You can see here that 20 M bars have an area of 300 millimeters squared. And we've got eight of them in our column. So we want to transform the section. So let's take a look at what we've got here. All right, so we have a column that is 250 by 350. And we have eight 20 M bars in it. Let's make me bigger here. Okay. So uh, the area of the steel 
is 8 times 300 millimeters squared or 2,400 millimeters squared. E of steel, we know, 200,000 MPa. The area of the concrete. Okay, so this is where I was saying we don't usually bother to remove the area of the steel when we're talking about um, rebar in concrete. It's probably a lazy thing, um, but often when we're designing with steel, we end up going back and adjusting the reinforcing a bunch of times. Um, so we've seen that it has very little impact on the overall effect on the system. So we, we, uh, the engineering community consistently just doesn't bother to remove the area of steel from the concrete. So we are actually going to do 250 by 350, which I probably should have drawn on here. Just good habit. 250 by 350. So our area is 250 by 350. Eighty-seven thousand five hundred millimeters squared. You can see that is a drastic difference in area. That has very little impact on that. The E of the concrete they told us was twenty-five thousand MPa. <clears throat> so we want to know the transformed. Uh, the transformed area where we're transforming the steel into concrete. So the transformed area is going to be the E of steel divided by the E of concrete times the area of the steel or 200,000 divided by 25,000 times the area of the steel, which was 2,400. So let's plug that into our calculator here. 200,000 divided by 25,000 times 2,400, and we get 19,200 millimeters squared. So if we turn that steel into concrete, if we pretended it was the equivalent stiffness of concrete, it would be about 19,000 versus 87,000 millimeters squared. So it's a lot smaller than the concrete, meaning it's much less stiff. Let's see what the area effective is for the total it's the same as our 87,500 plus 19,200. 87,500 plus 19,200. We get 106,700 millimeters squared. So by pretending our steel is concrete, it's the same as saying that we have a bigger column. Sometimes this process is a little bit easier than figuring out um, what percentage goes where, because now we could easily figure that out just based on area ratio. Okay, so that's transforming our section. Oops. All right, so that's worked out here. Okay, composite. All right, composite. If two objects or materials are combined so that they support loads as one, the system is said to be composite. In order for a system to be considered composite, the materials must be bonded so that they won't slip relative to each other. In axial loading, this is easy. 
But in bending, we need to make sure shear can be transformed across the plane where the materials interface. They can be two different materials, or they can be two different pieces of the same material. And we're going to look at an example of that. For bending elements, longitudinal shear is critical. So as we're bending something, we need to make sure these elements are bonded along the plane where they would be attached to each other. So longitudinal shear is critical. If there is no bond along the interface or the shear plane, the elements will slip along that plane. That's like two small beams sharing the load. If we ensure that two planes don't slip, it's like we have one deep beam. I think the next thing I have is an image. Okay, so if we have a 140 by 140 stacked on top of each other and they're spanning some distance. If we don't glue this, it's like these two things move independently. If we do glue this, it's like this one big deep element acts together. So this is non-composite. So the, this plane was not glued together. And you can see that they've, it's like we've got two elements bending like this, all right? Versus this, where we've glued them together or done something to ensure that they're bonding together so that they bend like this. Look at their stress profile or their strain profile. This is two small beams and this is one deep beam. What was our friend? What, what shape property was our friend in bending, if you guys remember? That's right, depth. Depth was very handy to us. So two smaller elements, I, don't, I wonder how they compare to one deep element. I have an idea. Let's do that calculation. Okay, so this is still our maximum stress at the extreme fiber. Okay, so for two 140 by 140 beams of the same material stacked on top of each other, calculate the shape properties for axial load, bending moment, and shear, and stiffness for both non-composite and composite versions. So basically, we want to figure out those shape properties. If you guys remember for axial load, the shape property is area. For shear, the shape property is area. For bending, the shape property is um, the section modulus, or S. And for uh, stiffness, the shape property is I. Rectangles, which it seems like we've got right here, we have derived those. We know what those are. The shape property for area for a rectangle is B times D. The shape property for, uh, for um, section modulus is BD squared divided by 6. Um, and then the shape property for I for a rectangle is BD cubed divided by 12. So let's see what that looks like for two elements stacked on top of each other versus one big element that has the two elements glued together. And we are, when we do the beam testing in a few weeks, we actually do this. And so I will show you um, beams where I stack them versus glue them and we see what impact that has on the load. So I find it a really helpful um, process. Okay, so we have this and this. B equals 140, D1 equals 140, and D2 equals 140. Over here, we have where this plane has been bonded in some way. They've done something to ensure that plane can't, can't slip relative to each other. So B 
equals 140. And D equals 280. And these are all millimeters. Okay. Area. Let's calculate area. The area for this one is 140 by 140 plus 140 by 140. So let's calculate that. We've got 140 by 140 plus 140 by 140. We get 39,200 millimeters squared. All right, let's calculate area for this one. We've got 140 by 280. 140 by 280, huh, it's the exact same. Well, that didn't seem to do much for us. Why would we bother to make things composite? For area, the area stays the same. It's the exact same thing. We went through a lot of work for no real great change. So that means, let's think about what, what types of things involve area. Uh, axial loads involves area and shear involves area. So it doesn't look like making things composite had a huge impact on shear and axial loads. Let's take a look at S or our section modulus. So if you guys remember, for a rectangle, it's BD squared divided by six, and that was BD. So for a rectangle, the section modulus is BD squared divided by six. Let's take a look at this. We've got 140 by 140 squared divided by six, plus 140 by 140 squared divided by six. So 140 by 140 squared divided by 6 times 2. We've got two of them here. Uh, let's one, we tend to divide it by uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We tend to write it as times 10 to the, 10 to the 6. So we've got 0 0.915 times 10 to the 6 millimeters cubed here. All right, let's come over here uh, and find the section modulus for this element. We've got 140 by 280 squared divided by 6. So 140 times 280 squared divided by 6. Ooh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We've got 1.83 times 10 to the 6 millimeters cubed. Look at that. That's double. We've doubled S. And remember, S is what allowed us to figure out the maximum load we could take. The maximum stress stays the same no matter what the material is, but part of the amount of moment we could take was dependent on our maximum stress by our S. So the maximum moment we could take increases or the maximum moment we could support increases by making it composite looks like by a factor of two for these two systems we have another part of our design which is stiffness and if you guys remember i is the shape property we use in deflection calculations and if you guys remember for a rectangle it was bd cubed divided by 12. so here we have 140 by 140 cubed divided by 12 plus 140 by 140 cubed divided by 12. 140 by 140 cubed divided by 12 times 2. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We've got 64.0 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth. Okay, so we've got a stiffness for this system, I. Over here, it is B, 
d cubed divided by 12, or 140 by 280 cubed divided by 12. 140 by 280 cubed divided by 12. We get 256.1 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. This is four times what this is. So area equals area. For making it composite, our S is, so, uh, so let's, area comp equals area, this is sharing, sorry, area sharing equals area composite. We have two times our area right here. So area, sorry, S composite is two times our S of sharing. And I composite is four times the I of sharing. So this is four times as large as this. So it's the equivalent of four of these. So that means this is much stiffer than this. This can take more bending load than this. That is a huge takeaway. Understanding that making things composite can increase your ability to uh, take bending moment and improve the stiffness of the member in bending. It doesn't have a big impact on shear and axial loads. It has a big impact on um, bending and it has a huge impact on stiffness. Okay. This is a really short lecture. I wanted to give you guys kind of a, a breather um, of time this week. Oh, you don't need me that big. Ooh. All right. Okay. What are some composite systems? Concrete on metal deck. We've talked about that a few times. The first time we looked at it was last year. Um, and I said that they take normal deck and they punch into the flutes. What that is doing is making the steel grab onto the concrete. Remember, the thing that's critical is this shear plane right here. We don't want those to slip relative to each other. So to make those not slip relative to each other, they punch the steel into the concrete and the concrete forms around it and grabs onto it so they can't slip relative to each other. We can make that concrete deck system composite with our steel beam. We can make use of that a little bit and it ends up looking like draw you guys a little image here okay so if this is our steel beam and this is our concrete on metal deck if they put these shear studs down through the concrete so they they shoot those down through the deck to the steel beam and then they pour the concrete afterwards that concrete bonds with the shear studs. And instead of just having a steel beam in bending, we have a steel beam with a top cord added on with that. So we've done two things. We've improved the depth somewhat, and we know depth is huge for us in bending. Um, and we've taken use, made use of the concrete in compression. And concrete is fantastic in compression, where steel tends to be, um, uh, a little bit worse in that respect. All right, remember when we were talking about our wood um, bending systems and we said that if the, the system was, um, or I guess it applied for the studs as well, uh, if they were connected to a plywood floor and they had the elements beside them in some regular pattern, 
we were essentially saying that that was a composite system. We are taking some of the plywood to help us out with that system. And so that was our class two. That was one of the ways you could think about what was making that a class two system. Our, um, our wood eye joists. So there was actually two parts to the composite there. OSB itself is a composite system. We have all kinds of elements that are kind of reminds me of an apple peel kind of going through and then they put it in a machine and they glue them together. The glue is providing that bond for longitudinal shear. And then we have pieces of lumber that are notched and glued top and bottom. So again, that glue is acting as our longitudinal shear transfer. And so those elements make this object act as one. Uh, SIP panels, where you have um, plywood or OSB top and bottom with um, insulation as your shear component in between. So almost all the work is being done by the plywood and the shear is just help or the, the, the insulation is just helping transfer shear loads. But again, what's critical is that bond between those elements. Flitch beams are more like um, load sharing because they're all side by side. Um, but the wood helps prevent the steel from buckling. Why would we bother with a flitch beam? Well, if you had a wall um, that was only uh, six inches uh, wide, putting in four plies doesn't work, but putting in three plies with some steel in between allows your beam to fit in the wall. Flitch beams aren't cheap. They add construction costs. Um, but we do them if we have no other choice to keep the system as a wood system. Glue lamb beams and glue lamb girders, they're composite. They are exactly like our system here that we were talking about. Just stacking the elements on top of each other doesn't do anything. It doubles the capacity. It helps. We've got improvement there. But gluing to them together really improves the system. So all of these have been glued along their longitudinal shear plane, allowing them to act as one deep member instead of a series of small members stacked on top of each other. What's really cool about that is I talked with some of you about during your studio uh, uh, meetings last week, is that because though we're starting from individual elements, we can curve them all independently. And as you know, it's a lot easier to curve a small element because it's not as strong in bending and then glue them together so we can get that curved shape. So here are some more curved glue lamb beams for a project that Dave did. I helped out with some of the engineering on it. So this is a built project. CLT is also a composite system. We are gluing those planes of lumber together. So what we have is um, the elements acting in the same direction aren't just stacked on top of each other. They actually have some extra depth in between them because of the planes going in the opposite direction. We can get into advanced composite systems. So strong, fine fibers and a matrix of a dissimilar material. So Fibers in glue, essentially, is what we have. The fibers can be glass or Kevlar or carbon. They are insanely strong. So the question is, why don't we start with them? If they're so strong, why don't we use them? Well, one, they're ridiculously expensive. And two, they buckle like you wouldn't imagine. So where we use them is in tension where they're helping remediate uh, problems and elements that might have seen uh, or the beginnings of localized failures. So concrete where we've got spalling, we can glue these on and take the job of the reinforcing. Um, maybe we'll do it where a column is trying to splay out or it's trying to pop out of its rebar cage. We can wrap it in Kevlar or a, a carbon fiber system that helps tie it together. So if our ties internally are starting to fail, we can wrap it from the outside. And we'll talk about those things 
what the job reinforcing does in those jobs in concrete next week. So what are our takeaway tips? Loads follow the stiffest path, and that's something you should just get in your head. Load sharing is additive. Composite action can make a member act like a bigger member. Longitudinal shear required for composite action in bending. That is a fantastic exam question. Calculate load sharing in a column. So you should be able to calculate load sharing in a column. Calculate transformed sections. And you should know the difference between load sharing and composite action, possibly with a quick calculation. I like these calculations because they're small, discrete calculations in the exam. Um, believe it or not, I do try to find the ones that are the easiest in the exam to give you. I have to be able to prove to the accreditation people that I have tested you on all the things. But as long as the exam includes some components of all of those things, we can make sure you guys have passed this course. Um, and these ones tend to be nice, discrete calculations. Okay, that's it. A bit of a breather week. I know you guys are all under the gun. Um, next week, we look at concrete. And I also think that one has the last submissible assignment. So you have assignment 9 and assignment 10. The last two weeks don't have assignments, but I do post um, uh, solved work problems that you can go through um, for those people that feel they need a bit more work on those problems. The last week with the beam testing, I will give you a, a chart that you should fill out with our tested elements, and there will be a question on the exam that has results from that testing. I need something to say that you guys watch the lecture. So make sure you get what all of those results are throughout the lecture and fill out your table so that in the exam you have access to that. Okay, that's the end of week nine and we're getting close to the finish. So uh, see you guys next week.